Hey, what's up, Street Talks? This is Eric Kim from the Eric Kim Street Photography Blog. I wanted to share uh, a video interview that I did with uh, one of the guys that shot street portraits of when I was visiting Philly to pick up my uh, my new Ford Fiesta for the Fiesta movement. So, when I was first in Philly, I you know I sent out a tweet and I'm like, hey, anyone in Philly want to hang out and shoot? And there's this guy named Chris Yuri, really cool guy by the way, street photographer there, shoots film and also is a journalist. And so we meet up. We hit up one of the really popular parks here. I forget exactly what the park was called. But, you know, we're there with our cameras, just strolling around, enjoying the, the beautiful weather. And, you know, one of the things I've been doing more with my street photography is, uh, nowadays I'm, I would say I'm less interested in candid photography and more interested in actually interacting with people and getting to know them and, you know, you know even directing them when I'm taking their photographs. So... You know, we're just kind of walking around looking for interesting characters. And I see this guy just kind of chilling back. And he had a really cool Knicks hat with, uh, you know, crocodile leather bill. Um, smoking a, a really huge uh, Cuban cigar. Had these really cool looking glasses. And I'm like, man, this guy looks awesome. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just uh, chatting with him, commenting on, you know, his outfit, how the how he's enjoying the weather and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And what he, what he shared with me really blew me away. I think my wrong pre-assumption was that he was just some regular dude who just like, looking fly, but he was actually a ex-Wall Street trader and had a huge passion for philosophy, knowledge, and, you know, quite, I would say quite enlightened, if I could say that, and so I end up speaking with him for about 30 minutes, and he's sharing me some incredible stories and insights and really opened up my mind, and I thought to myself, you know, if I just took a canned photo of him to say hello and walked on, I really wouldn't be able to get this uh, this human connection that I did with him. And, uh, you know, so we're chatting. And then uh, at the time, I had my GoPro in my backpack. And I was thinking, oh, this would be a great uh, interview because one of the projects I'm thinking about is doing more interviews with the people I photograph so I could share their personal stories with uh, the rest of the world. So I asked, oh, is it cool if I interview you? And he's like, yeah, sure. And so, you know, we did this interview and, you know, the guy just, what he said was really spot on and very inspirational to me. And so, you know, after the interview, uh, I had my camera with me, my like MP, and I was shooting Portra 400 with my flash. And I asked if I could take a few photos. He said, yeah, sure. So I took about seven shots of him, different angles and stuff like that. And it's, it's probably shot, I think, number four, where he's exhaling um, his cigar and his, the smoke's blowing out. That's really the shot. And one of the things I always encourage people is, Whenever you see an interesting person or interesting moment, don't just take one shot and go on, but rather try to really work the scene and try to take as many photographs um, as you possibly can without, you know, getting too annoying, I suppose. So anyways, uh, one of the things I, I really learned from this experience was the fact, uh, you know, once again, don't be afraid to engage people. And I believe, my personal belief is I don't think street photography has to be candid all the time. Generally, the candid photos are the more interesting photos, but... For me personally, interacting with people, getting to know them on a deeper one-on-one -on -one basis, hearing their life story, that means the world to me much more than uh, photographs ever will. I mean, if anything, the camera is just an excuse for me to talk to strangers, but really the interaction is what I, I value the most. Anyways, I uh, hope you guys enjoy the video uh, as well as uh, the photographs and get a little bit of wisdom from Eric Rivera. Both of us is Eric, which is pretty cool. All right, thanks for watching, guys. All right, peace out. Start you can ask me questions and yeah. then I'll tell you some answers. Right. So maybe just uh, start by introducing yourself. So what's your name? Where are you from? My name is Eric Rivera. I'm from New Jersey. Uh -huh. um, you know, I grew up in New Jersey, migrated uh, to the financial district in New York City, worked on Wall Street for a while, did some sentiment analysis, arbitrage, uh, you know, messed around with derivatives and also uh, you know, I have a special love for chaos theory as well as other uh, mathematics. Uh, I play chess uh, since uh, the age of uh, five years old. Uh, I speak Hebrew, I speak Spanish in three different dialects and English as well. Um, learning Mandarin as we speak. And um, I, love, I love beautiful women and, uh -huh, yeah. and I enjoy um, making money. So uh, tell us a little bit more about your joy of making money. Well, the joy, the joy of making money comes from uh, freedom. It comes from actually, uh, you know, getting yourself into a place where you're self-sufficient and you're independent. Uh, not independent just in a sense of 
of the word or the phrase, but you're independent in the sense where you don't have to worry about making your supervisor happy or, or dealing with corporate policies and structures that uh, you know aren't uh, like-minded with uh, what your actual personal morality and your personal uh, thought process is. So uh, a lot of people want to make money for superficial reasons. Others want to make money because they see that it's a way in which you can grow and actually be self-sufficient and um, you know not have to depend on the system. Um, me personally, uh, my thought process now as opposed to when I was a younger man is to literally uh, invest half of what I make and then reinvest 100% of the profits so that I can uh, have compounded growth. Uh, you know, and that that's really the only way to uh, accrue uh, generational wealth. So is there any certain, um, what do you invest uh, in? What do you recommend? Well, I, I wouldn't make any recommendations to a person. I would just say that if you're making any investment, you ought to be well versed in what you're actually putting your money into. If you're unaware, if something seems complex to you, I, then I wouldn't do it. I would actually deepen your understanding of whatever it is you're thinking about making an investment in. For instance, if you're a journalist, if you're a photographer, uh, you know, you're not just that because you decided to put that title before your first name. You're that because you took the hours and the weeks and the days and the years and you invested your, your irrevocable time, time that you couldn't get back. And, uh, and that time that you, you actually indulged and, and you made that investment into that craft or that industry, it can't be given back to you. So it's part of that time period that you spent, that you invested. And what you, what you got out of that necessarily wasn't money right away, but it was uh, experience, it was wisdom, it was the knowledge of the details of definitive uh, things that you actually learned uh, and the processes that you actually came up with during that uh, time that you spent that caused you to now become a photographer or a journalist uh, for that. Um, so I would tell anybody, if you're going to make an investment, make an investment in something that you understand, something that you're actually well versed in, something that you actually have wrapped your mind around and wrapped your heart around. You can't literally, the word desire, passion, emotions, and motives. Motion and motives, all of those words come from a word, a Latin word called movere. That's M-O-V-E-R-E. -E. The word movere, if you look it up when you get home, it means to move. That if you have a passion for something, it ought to move you in that direction. It ought to catapult you in that in that in that way. You know, you can't actually be successful at something that you have no passion for. You know, uh, you know unless you're hitting the lottery which the probability of that is slim to none. Uh, so uh, the gambler, for instance, is, is fooled when they go to the casino. They have a misinterpretation or a misunderstanding of the probability of them actually winning. So they associate uh, their, their, their potential of winning based on seeing someone else win which uh, they basically fooled by randomness. Oh, Nassim Taleb. Nassim Taleb is a, is a, is a, is a good, good, uh, good, you know, you, you actually shocked me by even knowing who Nassim Taleb is. Yeah. But Nassim Taleb, I've, I've sat in maybe 15 lectures of Nassim Taleb. Uh, I've met him several times. Uh, I'm a big fan of his writings uh, as well as his thought process. Uh, he is one of my favorites uh, with reference to uh, uh, the way he looks at the economy and things like that. Um, but like I was saying, with reference to desire, your desire, you become what your thoughts are. So what dominates your mind is what you ultimately become. Uh, and if you, know, if you want to be successful, you, you have to work at it. And in working at it, I mean actually spending time investing positive thoughts and thoughts that are actually going to propel you and build you and make you grow as a human being so that you can make an actual deposit into humanity uh, of something great. Uh, I really believe this. I really truly, uh, you know, I believe that you're wealthy uh, when you actually think wealthy. You know, not, it doesn't come with a, a certain net worth 
uh, it has a lot to do with your thought process. And if you, you have a poor mindset, if you have a poor thought process, then you will always be poor. Uh, I want to actually share a story with you. Um, and obviously, this is unrehearsed. Uh, this is totally from my experience, my life, my thoughts. And when I was in Cape Town, I went to Johannesburg, and then I went to Cape Town in, uh, in Africa. And when I went there, uh, as we were there on our third day of the visit, we met a girl. Uh, her name is Evidence. Uh, this girl, uh, when, when they told me her name, Evidence, I didn't really understand the significance of it until we learned her story. Her mother had, had died giving birth to her. Uh, her father had died before that, and her entire family was gone. Uh, her caretaker named her Evidence so that when people asked her where did her name come from, they would basically know that she was the evidence of her entire lineage, her family tree. She actually gave me this bracelet that I wear. Um, you know, nothing really, uh, you know, it's not like it's a Vacheron Constantine uh, Grand Complication or, you know, any type of, uh, you know, special uh, watch. But it is, in fact, a reminder of, uh, of, a, of a woman that I met at, the, at that time, she was 14 years old. Um, you know, it was around 2004. Um, but I got an email from the actual tour guide that was with us from Evidence. She actually graduated from a, an illustrious uh, university in England. I believe it was Cambridge. I'm not sure 100%. Um, but she graduated with a master's degree wow. um, in, in psychology. And to see someone come from such a poor village where uh, she had food insecurity, she didn't really know when she was going to get any water or anything to eat, uh, really didn't have a support system, didn't have any contacts, didn't have any resources. She simply had desire, something that you can't recruit, something that you can't see, something that you can't even disclose to another person. And her desire to actually want to achieve success and to want to better her and, and enhance her quality of life caused her to actually go from a village where she was actually predicted to die hmm. by the age of 12 My to God. actually graduating from an illustrious uh, you know, university. Um, is she successful? Compared to where she's from, she's a billionaire. Hmm. And, uh, I, and if I've given you anything in this interview, hmm. I've given you evidence. Hmm. Evidence that you can do whatever it is that your heart desires, that there's no limitations to what you can accomplish. There's no limitations on what you can do. And, and, and you have a sense of purpose. Every person has a purpose attached to them. I enjoy making money, but that's just a byproduct of who I am. There, there's so much more to an individual, to a human being, uh, that meets the eye or even meets the title of your career mm -hmm. or the industry that you work in. You have a lot to give, and I believe that the more you give, for instance, right now I'm giving you 10 to 15 minutes of my time, mm -hmm. and you're giving me 10 to 15 minutes of, of your time. And as we exchange this time and this experience, we actually share in cultural sharing share who we are we share our experience where we've been and i believe that this moment will be forever sketched in each other's minds and it will change the landscape of how you think when you meet other people in the city mm. uh, my name is eric rivera and eric kim yes it was uh good meeting you as well as your friend here what is his name chris chris chris, chris. it was great meeting you as well yep and, uh, it was an enjoyable time. Yeah. Hopefully you can put this together and yeah. actually uh, show it to me. Maybe even Chris can write yeah. it, write it up as a, as a story. And yeah. Uh, what what, what, new, what magazine? Is the newspaper. The Philadelphia Inquirer. The Philadelphia Inquirer. I think yeah. it will make a, a perfect story. Maybe the best way to end it is just take a nice puff of that Cuban right there. Yeah. This was the number two cigar in the aficionado list. It's called La Roma de Cuba, Mi Amor. It's, it's a great cigar. Uh, actually, she's the only woman I trust. <laughs> <laughs> nice. All right, with that, thanks for your time, Eric. You're welcome. All right, keep it real.